People are fighting over something you might be a bit confused about. A three letter acronym, ESG. 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 It's been around for years. You probably didn't notice because when people talk about it, they use lots of jargon. More granularity and transparency. To make it sound really dull. But things that don't matter don't create this much fuss. Environmental, social, and governance investing has become a cancer and a fraud within our capital market. The argument that I make and others on the left make about ESG is that this is all fake corporate virtue signaling. Real or marketing? It's a complete fraud. Uh, we're going to fight back against these attempts to deny or destroy uh, the whole idea of environmental, uh, social, and governance. Something in the world is changing, namely who has power and how he gets held to account. It's a huge deal, and I want to explain it to you, so let's dive in. If there's one thing we've learned in history, it's that it's rarely a good thing when you have massive power with no way to really hold it to account. Take, for example, Victorian Britain. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing, which was great, but living and working conditions for factory workers could often be terrible. Dangerous and dismal factories, poverty level pay, harsh discipline, and at that point it wasn't considered a big deal. This was normal. Not only that, but child labour was widespread and children were often treated brutally. Lisa. I want some more. Children started work at about eight years old. They might stand at the spinning machines repairing breaks in the thread or crawling beneath the machinery to clear it of dirt and dust while trying to avoid getting caught in the moving parts. A House of Commons report in 1832 noted that serious accidents were routine and one doctor in Manchester wrote in 1819, accidents were very often admitted to the infirmary, through the children's hands and arms having been caught in the machinery. In many cases, the muscles and the skin is stripped down to the bone. Last summer, I visited Lever Street School. The number of children who had received injuries from the machinery amounted to very nearly one half. So factory owners very much wielded significant power without scrutiny, and some of them exploited that power in the most ruthless way. But here's another lesson from history. When the system is wrong, when the system is broken, some people will try to fix it. Or if they can't do that, at least they will hold themselves to higher standards. Take this guy, George Cadbury the son of the founder of the hugely successful British chocolate company, which he went on to run with his brother Richard. Cadbury opened his most important factory in 1878. George Cadbury wanted to be different, so with his own money, he bought land to build a factory town, literally a town right next to the plant, for his workers to live in. This place, Bourneville, made good homes with good sanitation and good amenities available for relatively low cost. The factory installed canteens and sport grounds. It was the first company to give its workers time off. People said he would go broke with such an attitude. Well, he did it anyway. It was an early example that in amongst all of those who would just follow their own selfish interest and greed, you would sometimes get individuals who would follow public spirit and show leadership. That was then. This is now. Something really important has changed since the days of George Cadbury. Cadbury was a British company. It set higher standards by choice, but ultimately the lawmakers of Victorian Britain knew that British companies were subject to British law. They were accountable to the government of a day, and they had no arguments. But when globalisation really kicked in in the 1970s and then accelerated in the 1980s, the number of really big global multinational corporations ballooned and the size of the corporations did likewise. Suddenly you had massive corporations that could choose to site themselves or their regional centres pretty much anywhere in the world. Even in the 1980s, we had reached the stage where 51 of the largest economies in the world were corporations, not national governments. 
and today that number has risen to 69. And most of them go wherever the local circumstances suit their business interests the best. From having been the ones who were originally in control, national governments now found themselves competing to try to attract these companies to cite themselves in their location because of the jobs and the wealth creation that that would bring. And they did that by offering lower levels of regulation, lower taxes, anything that would reduce the cost of business. In other words, the power relationship had just flipped. And because of the scale of these businesses, they have started to impact the world in significant ways. Elon Musk's Tesla aims to bring forward the age of renewable energy. Social media companies created products to connect the world. And so they did, sometimes to great benefit, but also with apparent real costs. To people's ability to concentrate, to their civil discourse, to their mental health, their freedom from harassment. Digital currencies were created to try to be better for the world than national currencies. A huge disruption by design. Companies are developing artificial intelligence, which will have also huge impacts. Possibly good, possibly bad, and the list goes on. All of these things are massively changing the world. The question is, where is the accountability? So Elon Musk can meet with the leaders of China and France and Germany and the UK because all of them want him to do business in their country. He can offer or he can withdraw on a whim internet services to war-torn Ukraine, a service that could shift the direction of that globally important conflict. His huge fleet of satellites have filled the skies, making observing the stars from observatories much more difficult. Now, did anyone consider and give permission for that trade-off before it happened? Nope. So, with all that power, what else can you do to hold it to account? That, as you might expect, is where ESG comes in. Before ESG, there was a thing called corporate social responsibility. The idea behind corporate social responsibility, CSR, was that companies should take responsibility for their impact on the world. Hold themselves to account. Don't pollute. Don't be the enablers of child or forced labour. Treat your employees well. Offer equal opportunities. Notice if your product has negative consequences on the world and do something about that. And do these things even when the law doesn't require it. Why would you do any of those things? Because if you did it right, it was good for business. Ask George Cadbury, whose business went from strength to strength, while some of his more greedy competitors fell by the wayside. So businesses started to decide that they needed to try to be profitable and socially responsible. And of course they wanted to get credit for the things they were doing. So they started doing these things called CSR reports, which were aimed at their employees, their shareholders, their local communities, their customers, the people who were the stakeholders of the business. The principle was that even though there weren't global rules, if you were transparent about your business and the impacts that it had and what you were doing about them, that would put pressure on the business in order to improve. Just one problem, employees, customers, local communities, not famous for reading corporate reports. People churned these reports out. They sweated blood into all the details and tried not to notice that nobody was reading them. But do you know who does like reading reports? Investors. And there was a growing breed of investors who were signed up to this journey. They said, we as investors believe that this is going to be necessary for the future. We also think that companies that manage these sorts of issues well are generally well-managed companies. The argument was companies who were committed to social responsibility would be better bets. They would provide higher returns more reliably because they were managing their risk well, because they were going with the grain of where the future was. Hence, you ended up with the investor branch of corporate responsibility. And it was down to environmental, how you manage your impacts on the planet, social, how you manage your impacts on society, 
and governance, generally how well structured they were to manage the business with integrity. ESG. And suddenly you have specialist ESG investors and they're creating indices to measure how well companies score on a number of those measures. $2.5 trillion invested in ESG funds right now. In other words, in itself, it has reached the scale where it now has real power of its own. Unsurprisingly, people have started to push back against some of this and say, well, hang on a moment, who sets these rules? And how are they held to account for the power that they're now wielding? I mean, is it actually true that highly rated ESG companies do better in the marketplace because they're better led and they have better risk management? One study in 2019 said that it found no evidence that high sustainability ratings, in that case using Morningstar ESG ratings, turned into higher financial return. Although the study period was only 11 months, which is rather short to come to definitive conclusions. Well, you might decide that even then, the trade-off is worth it. Worth reducing financial performance just a little in order to get superior impact on the environment and on society and with good governance. Again, another study, this one from 2022, he found that high ESG scores weren't correlated with how well companies complied with regulations, nor their actual levels of carbon emissions. Now, both of those studies focused on just one ESG rating system, Morningstar. If you'd looked at a different system, you might have found that they were recommending different companies and maybe you would have got a different result. But then to some extent, isn't that the point? If you can look at different ESG rating systems, Surely, if what they were measuring was real, then the same companies would all come out of the mix. And the fact they don't, they come up with different lists of companies, shows you there's a lot of subjectivity going on. How do you really judge anyway? Whether a company is a good company or a bad company. Let's take, for example, two oil companies. One of them has been regressive and obstructive on the issue of climate change. But it has world-leading health and safety systems, rarely has accidents and looks after its people extremely well. Another has been progressive and constructive on climate change, but has had real problems on health and safety with a number of major accidents around the world involving loss of life. Which one would you give the higher ESG ratings and why? These are real companies, by the way. Or do you just damn them both for being fossil fuel companies in the first place? In which case, why would they care about those things if you're going to say they're beyond the pale and not worth even talking to? It's a riddle wrapped within a conundrum, wrapped within a... another really big thing. And the ESG ratings that assign numbers and scores and rankings very much give the impression of having made a science out of it, and therein lies the problem. Which is why on one side of the equation you get campaign groups who will dismiss it all as greenwashing. That it's effectively greenwashing and you don't really mean any of it. And look, we all know that this goes hand in hand with political polarisation in the United States, and there are certain issues that have become touchstone issues that are central to that division between people. Whereas in the early days of CSR, you would get people focusing on values-based issues that were sort of universal to everybody. Companies used to make an asset out of their political neutrality, but increasingly they were told that making a political stand was part of that ESG deal. Now, Nike is the most prominent recent example of brands taking a stand on social issues. Companies are choosing not to play it safe, but to take a stand on a cause that they know will appeal to the people who will buy their products. Suddenly you had a bunch of people saying, this ESG thing kind of looks like co-opting corporate power for political purposes. Speaking from Naples, Governor DeSantis says ESG is just another way to push a quote, political agenda. But even if you ignore the culture war stuff, 
there were certainly some voices being raised with scepticism that filling in endless detailed questionnaires was actually about making their businesses better. Warren Buffett, one of the most successful American investors, was basically asked his position, and his response came down to that. We want our managers to do the right things. We give them enormous latitude to do that, and I think that our batting average really is quite good. We are not going to spend our, the time of the people at Berkshire Hathaway Energy responding to questionnaires or trying to score better, and we keep expenses and needless reporting down to a minimum at Berkshire. Some opponents of ESG said that Warren Buffett had said that ESG was a scam. Not what he said. He actually said he trusts the managers that he has chosen to do the right thing and that all of the various questionnaires and all the detailed bureaucracy isn't necessary to do that. There can be a significant amount of truth in that if you genuinely get people whose instincts and values are to do the right thing. It can also be a very good line simply to avoid all responsibility. So here's where we are. The problem that ESG was designed to solve, how we hold powerful corporations to account how we evolve capitalism in order to clean up its own messes, that problem hasn't really been fixed by ESG. But those who think that ESG was just made up for a political group to push their own agenda and that therefore, as long as you resist it, it will just go away, they are probably going to be disappointed. Why? Because power needs to be held to account. And indeed, the people on that side want corporate power held to account on some of the issues that they care about. So we will need to evolve a new approach, something that isn't the same as ESG, that works better, but is designed to do the same thing. I'm not sure we're going to get there until all the fighting has subsided over these issues that we think are so important, but it'd be really good if we could get this right, because businesses and the society they're part of, all of us, we really are in the same boat. And it'd be good to find ways of creating wealth for the future in ways that don't threaten to sink the boat. As always, if you got this far and you like this video, please like. And if you're not already, subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell so you get to hear about new videos when they're produced.